wine is kind of homeopathic. So if you challenge the wine with oxygen when it's young, it gets stronger oh. and it can age a lot longer. So we're not oxidizing the wine. Okay. We're building its structure using oxygen. So it would be handy to be able to measure how much chi, how much life energy that wine has. Well, it could be that it's a wine you just made and you want to know which program to put it in or whether it's blending or it could be something you're just about to bottle and you want to see if it's ready to bottle or if it's going to get reductive in the bottle and get all stinky when close up on you. Or let's just say you're at a wine auction and you're thinking about, uh, you see a case of 1970 Chapel Latour and you'd like to know whether it's dead or not. We can measure that all those things by looking at the wine's oxygen appetite. So wow. I think wine that's oxygen. a really cool thing to be able to do. It sounds to me, it's like putting your three-year-old in the playground, letting him eat dirt to build up resistance. Yeah, so- yeah, kind of like that. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 66. Would you rather drink a wine that's styled like the actress Angelina Jolie or the French philosopher Bertrand Russell? Do you know how modern winemaking techniques are affecting the wines you drink and why you should care? Well, our guest on the podcast today has some stimulating and controversial ideas to change the way you think about the wines you drink. Clark Smith is a winemaker, consultant, author, inventor, musician, professor, and provocateur to the wine industry around the planet. This conversation first aired on my regular Facebook Live video show, so occasionally you'll hear me respond to viewer questions and comments. You can join that conversation every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll put a link where you can find us in the show notes, as well as links to Clark's website, social media handles, and the video version of this conversation at nataliemclean.com forward slash 66. I just want to note that our internet connection was a bit shaky, so the audio is a little echoey in places, and the interview ends abruptly when we lost the connection. However, I know you'll find Clark's ideas well worth the extra listening effort this week. And speaking of good connections, why not connect with me personally? Sign up for my free online video wine class, The Five Wine and Food Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever. Go to nataliemclean.com forward slash class and choose a time and date that work for you. I look forward to connecting with you there. Okay, on with the show. Would you rather drink a wine that is styled like the American actress Angelina Jolie or the French philosopher Bertrand Russell? Do you know how modern winemaking techniques are affecting the wines you drink and why you should care? Our next guest has some provocative and stimulating ideas to change the way you think about the wines you drink. Our guest, Clark Smith, he has created a firestorm in the wine industry, dividing winemakers and wine lovers alike around the idea of wine manipulation. What is that? He's going to answer it. Clark will also explain some of the hottest technologies that help winemaking and how splitting the atom changed the way we make white wine and altered our perception. Clark has spent more than four decades as a winemaker, author, innovator, musician, and professor in the wine world. He is a product of MIT, UC Davis, and trained over 4,000 winemaking professionals. The IQ Conference named him 2016 Innovator of the Year in the wine world. He holds several patents in winemaking, and his book, Postmodern Winemaking, 
was named Wine Spirits Magazine's 2013 Wine Book of the Year. Welcome, Clark Smith. Hello. It's so great to have you here. So I introduced you. I left out things. Tell us more about you and maybe share a little bit also about your personal life, if you would, Clark. Sure. Well, in a nutshell, I, I'm a, a, an East Coast brat from uh, New Jersey, where I picked up my attitude, and then Love it. wandered out to California and got a job in a liquor store in 1971. You know, that was when the wine industry was really tiny. There were only about 250 wineries in the United States and Canada at that time. And it was a time when you could get to know everybody and taste all the wines. Today, that would be quite impossible. There's over 100 times that many wineries and wines out there now. But there was this kind of explosion. I got pretty excited about it. And uh, in uh, 1976, I was visiting some wineries in Oregon. Was it was talking with Bill Fuller at the Wallaton. And, and I just said, you know, I got to get in on this thing. So I think I'm going to stop selling it and start making it. My wife turned to me and said, I wondered when you were going to figure that out. So I started with a little winery called Veter Crest that had some vineyards in Napa. And then I went to Davis and finished up the bachelor's and the master's. And then I, I got hooked up with some growers in uh, Dunnigan Hills in the Central Valley. We started a brand called R.H. Phillips. We started off at about $2 million in debt and 3,000 oh. cases. 17 years later, we were a third of a million cases. And Vincor, a Canadian company, bought yep. us. For $94 million. So, yes, uh, now Constellation, now Artira. There's been three yeah. jumps since then. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so I explored making wine at a big winery or creating a big winery. But I noticed that we never made any extra money when we got bigger. We always seemed to make $50,000. You know, when we were 3,000 cases, we made $50,000. <laughs> we were a third of a million cases. We made $50,000. So I decided to figure out how small I could get and still make $50,000. And so I make uh, Winesmith now. I started that ah. this brand in Crucible. That's my fancy Napa Cabernet. Why do you call it Crucible? Uh, part of it is that I think it's not like a Napa Cabernet. It's not a lap lap impact wine. I think a lot of Napa Cabernet has gotten to be kind of clown wine, you know, with lots of alcohol and, and nasty tannins and even sugar. And I like to make something a little more classic, my trainings in Bordeaux. So that's part of it. Part of it is that the tannins are sort of melted. Like, you know, what a crucible is, it's a little bowl that jewelers use to alloy metals together. And so I always think of Nathaniel have... Hawthorne, the crucible, and, you know, like testing your metal whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's, of course, the Arthur Miller play on the Salem Witch Trial. So yeah. there's a bit of dynamic tension in everything I do. Clearly. Uh, so anyway, I know I make about a thousand cases and I make okay. $50,000, you know. So you're in your and sweet I, spot. Well, I think it's everybody's. I've told the story a thousand times and, uh, you know, now we have like 25,000 wineries and they all kind of make $50,000. 25,000 wineries in California? No, no, in the in North America. In North America, okay. Wow, I didn't even know yeah. there were that many. Yeah, okay. there's about a thousand in Canada. There's actually nine thousand bonded wineries, but most brands now will make wines together in a, in right. a custom press facility, like a virtual so. winery. I think they call it, or a custom yeah. label, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call it tanks, but no tanks. <laughs> like a big hat, no cattle. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, I did that and I started at the end of Phillips. I think I was making really good modern white wines and my red wines were kind of awful. Why? And well, I think it was because of this idea that we had been taught in school, in winemaker school, that wine is a chemical solution. And I've come to realize that that's not true. Why do you mean by uh, chemical solution? You know, like water and alcohol with a bunch of stuff dissolved in. So it can be scientifically defined or a recipe or whatever. Yeah, through, in other words, just a random mix like soda pop. But actually, I've come to realize that it has a structure, like a Bernays sauce has a structure or a bisque has a structure. Would you rather have a vegetable consomme or a lobster bisque? 
you know what I'm talking about? The beast is much more soulful, and that's because it has suspended gooch in there. It has a, suspended like a what? Watery part did, in you, a, in a, did you say gooch? Well, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I thought it was a technical gooch, term, sorry. Yeah. Gooch. Yeah, I love the that's taste of gooch. That's a jargon term, a gooch. But if you compare, like a consomme is basically a solution of vegetable flavors. Right, right. Uh, whereas a I like feast that. has a fatty part and a watery part, and they're very finely blended together. And so that allows that beast to have a whole lot of different flavors all married together like a symphony orchestra, and that's what oh. makes it much more soulful than a, a consomme could ever be. Oh, and you know your music, which is a whole other topic which we can dive into. You shared some of your personal life. Tell me a little bit of that, if you're willing to share it. I don't know. I, I live in Santa Rosa, California, and yeah. I make wines all over California. And uh, and I have about 100 clients scattered around the U.S. and Canada and, and some overseas. But, you know, I'm very, very musical. I, I'm in a barbershop quartet and a Robert Shaw Corral and... I'm actually the president of the Redwood Chordsman, which is our local barbershop chorus. And then I sing in my wife's uh, church choir. She's and there. you just got married. I just got married. Her name is Ruthie Wells, and she's extremely wonderful and a great singer, composer, and uh, musical director. Sounds very harmonious. Yes. That's yeah, all right. <laughs> Clark, you know, you're such an innovator. What is your favorite or most memorable innovation what stands out for you you've got patents all kinds of things so tell well, us. um i think the most important thing that i've ever worked up was this oxygen appetite thing we've got this gizmo costs about ten thousand dollars and what it does mm-hmm. is it looks through the bottle at blue at dot on the inside of the glass and it can measure the oxygen content inside of a bottle of wine without opening it up So that allows us to look at how fast that's changing and make predictions about how long the wine can age, just kind of how much testosterone it's got. (laughs) Is that at all linked to micro-oxygenation? Well, a little bit. You know, I can explain micro-ox really easily. It's just like, we were talking about red wine. So they have a lot of unstructured tannin when they're young, and they also have all these yeast leaves. When you make a souffle, you separate the yolk from the white. Now, the whites are like the tannins, all right? So we're just going to make those tannins into a rich, light, stable structure with a wire whisk, right? Only we use oxygen to turn the tannins into a rich, light structure. So we end up with a wine that has more volume in the mouth and is more refined, but also ages longer. Because you separated Uh, the tannins somehow? Well, if we have the leaves present when we do this, it doesn't work. Because the leaves just gobble up all the oxygen. So that's a little bit like when you try to make a souffle. You have to make a meringue first. And then you can fold the yolks back in for fatness and richness. That's what we do with yeast leaves. But we have to wait until we've built the structure or the whole thing doesn't work. So there's a timing issue. So wine is kind of homeopathic. So if we challenge the wine with oxygen when it's young, it gets stronger. Oh. And it can age a lot longer. So we're not oxidizing the wine. Okay. We're building its structure using oxygen. So it would be handy to be able to measure how much chi, how much life energy that wine has. Well, it could be that it's a wine you just made and you want to know which program to put it in or whether it's blending. Or it could be something you're just about to bottle and you want to see if it's ready to bottle or if it's going to get, you know, reductive in the bottle and get all stinky uh, when close up on you. Or let's just say you're at a wine auction and you're thinking about, a, you see a case of 1970 Chapel Latour and you'd like to know whether it's dead or not. We can measure right. that, all those things by looking at the wine's oxygen appetite. So wow. I think wine that's oxygen. a really cool thing to be able to do. It sounds to me, it's like putting your three-year-old in the playground, letting him eat dirt to build up resistance. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is kind of like that. Any of this stuff, you know, I have a website, whoisclarksmith.com, and it's got the geeky stuff and the postmodern stuff and the wine and music stuff and stories about the wines and videos about the wines and all that stuff. That's Grand Central Station. You've got some great videos on there and some great resources from layman to techie, and I do recommend people come to it. Maybe I ought to kick in this movie analogy that you've been alluding to. I'm not quite sure how Angelina Jolie got into it, but... (laughs) 
that's uh, from an article that was about you. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, I do think every consumer, every time they open up a bottle of wine, they ought to start trying to speculate about what the winemaker was trying to do. And that's really just like Netflix. There's kind of three kinds of movies. you got your Disney comedies that make you smile. And so those are wines that are trying to shoot your basket, you know, like, Happily uh, ever after. Going, okay, please me. You know, I have desires. I have loves. Please me, you know. So there are wines that are designed to do that. And they often have sugar or a lot of oak or something like that. And, uh, you know, the point of the wine is not really about the wine at all. Then you've got the action adventure wines, sort of like Claude Van Damme movies, you know. The Vin yeah, Diesel. Vin Diesel and Bruce Willis and all of those guys. Those wines aren't even supposed to be particularly pleasant, but they're supposed to really impress you. And I think that's kind of what's happened to Napa Cabernet, is that okay. it's so expensive that people think, well, you know, for 300 bucks a bottle, you ought to slap me around a little bit. So those are impact wines. That The whole idea is that you taste and you go, wow. You know, I don't make wines like that at all. I, I don't knock your socks off when you taste my wines. You'll still be fully clothed, but... But I kind of hope that you'd be sorry when it's gone. So that's a little bit more like dramas and foreign films, where you know you kind of have to talk yourself into even trying them. And then, but but those will be those will be the movies that at the end you go, oh, yeah, okay, that's five stars. I really you had to work. You had to read the subtitles, but you remember the plot. Right, right, exactly. So you have to work out a little bit. And I think you know, look, I really love Cabernet Franc, and one of the things I like about it is is that you have to work at it. You have to shoot the wines basket. Just like if you were, you know, listening to Mozart or rap, you go, well, you know, a lot of people love this. I wonder what it is they love about it. And you have to investigate instead of just sticking with your own little uh, tastes that you had when you were five years old, you could start delving into different kinds of pleasure that you might not have seen. Or for grownups. So you segued nicely. I've got Cave Spring Cabernet Franc from Niagara. What is it about Cabernet Franc you love so much? Well, Cabernet Franc is the father of Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is the mother. That's a little weird because Cabernet Sauvignon is a big boy. I kind of think of it like Cabernet Sauvignon will always be generous. It'll be rich and dense and muscular. And if it's made right, in other words, kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and maybe you can put him in a nice tux. But Cabernet Franc's more like Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, a lot more floors on the intellectual elevator, leaner and, uh, <laughs> you know, more energetic and, and a little smarter. And so Cabernet Sauvignon is generous and broad. Cabernet Franc is energetic and deep. And, and do it you also ages a lot longer, even though it's not a big wine. Well, we're not really sure, but it's a very vigorous vine. And if you can convince it in a poor soil, that you put that energy into a root system, then it'll pull all kinds of minerality out of the soil. We're not quite sure what minerality is. I got a whole chapter in my book, but it doesn't really say anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we just don't know what it is. We know what kinds of soils it comes on and that organic practices can support it. It's a kind of an energy. I'm not talking about the smell of wet stone. I'm talking about this buzz and the finish, which is often confused with acidity. Yeah, so that's. When, I've heard that before. I'm just yeah, still in search of a good definition. Well, you know, people will talk about Mosels. They go, well, geez, these are pencil thin little wines, but they age 30 years because of the acidity. And that's not true. Uh, we can make wines with just as much acidity, but they don't age very well at all. It's like acid. It's that same kind of tingle, but it's in the throat. All Portuguese ports have it because they're always, by law, grown on schist. Pretty much all Burgundies have it because they're grown on limestone. So schist, just for those who don't know, how is that related to soil? Is that like limestone? What is that? Schist. Oh, schist is iron containing sediments that were stacked on top of each other and then through tectonic plate action, they get turned up like this. So it's a soil, it's a it's like a granite that's on its side. Oh, and, so and the many roots different go features. down through the, the slots. It, it's very rare, but the whole region of Doro, Doro yeah. where port is made is all schist. 
that's the first appellation in history. And in fact, it was a beheading offense to try to sell grapes from off of the schist. The Marcus, oh, the, the pombal really? would cut your head off. Yeah. Who would cut your head off? Well, the Marcus, the pombal. There's a little town in the middle of the world. It's rather drastic. <laughs> but they took it seriously, is all I'm saying. So so I don't know why. I mean, I, I make this faux chablis. It's a right. Chardonnay from Napa. Okay. Faux chablis, because you're recognizing it's not chablis. It's made from Chardonnay on oak, I assume. Right. Well, I use some untoasted oak. It doesn't have any toast or butter. Or I don't take it through malolactic. And uh, the current vintage is 2005. It takes 12 years for it to come around in the bottle. So you don't release it for that yeah. long? Yeah. Wow. That's how and you stick to 50000 a year, I'm sure. Like you've tied it all up in your cellar. Well, it just isn't ready, but I think it's kind of a miraculous wine. But it's the minerality, I'm convinced, that makes it age that long. And uh, that Again, we, we really don't know chemically what's going on, but I hope to hope to work on it. Oh, I'd like to hear more about that throat energy, though. I like that versus just plain old acidity. So, Clark, you wanted me to pick up a couple of Cabernet Francs because you love them. But also, you asked me to get a Niagara Cabernet Franc. So I got Cave Spring. And you want to talk about the way Cabernet Franc is treated in different regions. The other one I was able to pick up was from mostly saint Emilion, So it has a large percentage of good, Cabernet good. Franc. Yeah. With Merlot, I think. I can't read the percentage. Yeah, they're usually about two-thirds Cab Franc, one-third Merlot. Now, what are we looking for when we look at the differences in how Cab Franc is treated, say, in these regions? And there's more. I tried to find a Loire Valley Cabernet Franc. Our dear LCBO did not have them. But talk about these two. Yeah, and- well, well, well. let's let's start with the Loire versus saint That's That's a sure. good place to start. Sure. This is the whole basis of postmodernism is that, well, let's just say Chateau Latour makes a lousy Beaujolais. What do you mean by that? Wrong grape in the well, wrong, right region? That, right, right. That there's no such thing as good wine. What there is is good for the moment, good for the occasion, appropriate yeah. to the terroir. And you're not supposed to make big, heavy, long-aging wines in Beaujolais. You're supposed right. to make light, fruity picnic wines. And if you had a picnic and you took a young bottle of Chateau Latour out there, it'd be awful. And I really do think that California is really and Canada, too, really missing the boat. On Cabernet uh, Franc? In general, uh, trying to market our wines based on varietal naming rather than place name. You know, Europe's grown way beyond that now. And so, you know, it would be silly in France to do a Cabernet Franc taste because you need to know which ones are the Chinons and the Bourgoyes because those are supposed to be steely, you know, just very masculine piercing kind of cold wines, whereas a saint Emilion is always very feminine, very generous, the sort of lamb fat from the Merlot fills in the cracks and you end up with very round, warm, comforting wines. So their job is just completely different. They're both Cabernet Francs, but it's silly to speak of them that way because there's more variation between the two regions than the single varietal name would indicate. It's more accounted for the region than the grape. Yeah, yeah, I really think so. And we don't even think of wines that way in North America. We just go, oh, well, I have a Chardonnay. You know, well, what kind of Chardonnay? Well, where was it from? And Cabernet Franc probably varies from region to region more than any other grape. So Niagara is really interesting because if it's grown right, it's very fleshy. It has a lot of color. This does. Uh, and some roundness to it. Yep. That's a pure Cabernet Franc there. It is. And yet it's, so good. But it will still have this edge, really. It does. I, it's not if flabby. If I had to compare it to a French wine, I'd say it's more like a broth. You would go there. But, okay. Well, certainly it's not as steely as a Loire wine and not as fat and feminine as a Senna wine. So a little more manual. That's really interesting. We are really pushing Cab Franc in Canada, especially Ontario. It, there's a movement here between Gamay well, and Cab Franc. For the area. It is. The cool climate really does well. You know, I really like the ones up in uh, Prince Edward. Oh, County, yeah. Too. Yes, absolutely. That is an exploding, exciting region. There's so many great wineries up there. There's 30 now, and a number of them right. are doing Cab Franc. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get back to you, Clark. 
Can you take us back to the moment when you knew you wanted to make wine? Kind of where were you? How did you feel? What was the moment you said, ah, I need to make well, wine? Well, you know, the reason I dropped out of MIT is I just couldn't decide what I wanted to do. You know, there were so many wonderful possibilities there. Francis Crick and Noam Chomsky and, and uh, Lurian Poiber and Leacock and Pierce and Edmund Land. All these people were my freshman teachers. It was crazy. It's amazing. And I just couldn't pick something. And then when I was selling wine, it was just a job at first. But then I started to see this huge multiplicity. And then I realized that it was an unexplored area that none of us knew what we we're doing. That's because this is, comes back to this modern wine thing that in 1960, 95% of the wine made in California, which basically the wine made in the United States, was port and sherry. We really didn't have any table wine. Even in 76, when Chateau Manolino won the tasting in Paris, there were only 11 acres of Chardonnay in the Napa Valley, and that, wow. that wine was from Sonoma. We didn't know anything, and our wines were sort of terrible. I mean, half the wine on the shelf back then would have been considered unmerchantable today. So we were learning, and I thought that was really cool. And we were growing. It seemed like a way to make a contribution. And I guess what attracts me to wine, just like music, is that it's science and service to art. It's highly technical, but in the end, it's really about communicating soul to soul. Oh. It's very human. I love that. It's the intersection, that science and humanity. Even Steve Jobs talked about that. The best brings together those two worlds. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, in the end, even in science, the human connection is really what it's all about. And I think scientists ought to spend a lot more time thinking about their relationship to observation as humans, Mm -hmm. what observation really is, and then also the social consequences of discoveries. Absolutely. There's Um, been so much talk about that. Like, I'm not going to get off track, but with the Google memo from that engineer coming out to soft skills, actually, it's where they meet and, you know, we undervalue. I actually think that what we call the hard sciences are really soft. And the soft sciences are really the hard sciences because they get closer to what's actually going on, which is a human. The human. And, and I've, uh, I'm actually writing, my next book is called The Mental Science. I just got back oh. from a month in Ireland writing. So amazing. Have you written several? So postmodern winemaking. This is the yeah. one that was the 2013 Wine Book of the Year by Wine and Spirits magazine. So Yeah, and we got to the top of Eric Asimov's list for the, oh, the five, New York Times. top books of the Times. And, Woohoo! You know, it did well. Good for uh, you. Yeah, that's my first published book. I've been writing articles for 40 years. Anyway, the next one will be called The Myth of Science. The Myth of Science. We look forward to it. So, Clark, you have caused lots of controversy in the wine world, which I always love to talk to someone who is interesting like you. Why have people polarized around your views? The whole wine manipulation thing. What is that? If you can sort of boil it down for us. Why are people all in a kerfuffle about that? Well, I think it's really our fault as winemakers you know, in the 70s, like I said, we didn't know what we were doing. So we were all talking to each other. It was a very, very open industry. As we started to get more competitive, and also all this new technology started coming out, you know, it used to be that everybody that drank wine was a geek. And you could talk to them about very complex things. Now it's gotten sort of dumbed down more and more. And so we're reluctant to kind of drag people through the dirt of technical conversations that they may not really have the bandwidth for. And so we've been perfectly comfortable for them to think, you know, Lucy stomps the grapes and then, you know, then we put some vodka in and that's wine. That's what most people think wine is. And we haven't done very much to educate the public. I think we're missing that. Here's what's weird is that winemaking changed completely and forever right around World War II at the same time as the American kitchen. Oh. You know, refrigerators, stainless steel, electricity, lights. That's all brand new. You know, wineries never had any of that stuff. Temperature control, fermentation. Stainless steel. You know, this was the big revolution. Nobody ever even noticed it because we all grew up with these kitchen appliances and stuff. And we were perfectly comfortable with 
with electric lights and stainless steel and refrigeration. That all seems, it doesn't seem like technology, but it completely changed the way we were born. But then some stuff got a little geekier, like reverse osmosis and enological uses of oxygen when everybody had been taught that oxygen was the enemy of wine. And it just got kind of complicated. So people just stopped talking about it. And I invented, for example, a, a way to take acetic acid out of wine, basically vinegar. Why would and, we want uh, to do that? Is it a fault? Yeah, sure. It's a sourness in the finish. But the weird thing is that the grapes that turn to vinegar are the best grapes. Which ones? Well, like really good Napa Cabernets, for example. You know, the birds will go find the best vineyard and attack <laughs> it. And that's where the bacteria comes from. So mostly we were dealing with really high-end wines that had spoiled. And we figured out a way to take the acetic acid out. Well, nobody really wants to talk about that, you know, sort of open heart surgery. So we just kind of got in the habit of becoming more and more secretive and more and more just saying, I do the minimum, you know, whatever that is. Right, that's a mantra. I pick between the raindrops and I'm non-interventionist. Well, it, you know, I, I know thousands <laughs> of winemakers and believe me, they're all sweating bullets 24-7, 365. Winemakers work really hard. And uh, I do think that it's important for the winemakers work to be invisible. So and what do you, you mean know, by that? You well, don't... the influence of the winemaker, for me, I want to show the grapes. If I'm going to use oak, I want it to be invisible. I want it to be in support, sort of like uh, cosmetics, you know. To me, if a woman's putting makeup on, it's great if you can't tell she's wearing it. You right. know, and it just right. enhances in some subtle ways. So that's kind of the way I like to work with wine. And that's a lot of work to be invisible. It's not like there's wines of effort. You know, Randall Graham's one of my best friends, but he's always talking about Van Deffel and Van de Terroir. And excuse me, but it takes a lot of effort to make Van de Terroir. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're just chefs. You know, we're cooks. Winemaking is a fancy form of canning. Oh, that's going well, to go to this. It's, it's preserving fruit. And so... All wine is very highly manipulated. Those aren't grapes in the glass. It's wine. You know, we crush it, we press it, we ferment it, we age it. We do all kinds of You've stuff. You've handled it. it, yeah. You know, the definition of manipulation, meaning handling with skill, well, that's another, it's a synonym for artisanality, and everybody admires that. But it's this idea of deceit that comes in with manipulation, you know, manipulating for your own purposes. It gets in there, and I think it's just got to stop. I feel quite insulted when people talk about this. They'll usually be talking about wines that are badly made. I'm not in favor of bad cooking, but if you make the whole idea of intentionality in making wine into a crime, then people will be poorly educated about it, and they'll make shitty wine, and that's what's happening. And the whole natural wine movement mostly is coming from a stance, and I respect it that wine has a sacredness to it that beer and spirits really don't have. I mean, nobody ever gives brewers any shit about manipulation because that's the essence of making beer. I do think that they're getting at something, and I also don't think that we've been very forthright in uh, you know, bragging about what we do, the way Wolfgang Puck gets on TV and you know, say, well, I've got this really ripe brie, but I want to grate it, and so I'm going to freeze it with liquid nitrogen. You want to watch and they take pride in that, how I'm yeah, going to change yeah. this ingredient. And we should, too. We should, too. I mean, I developed a lot of new techniques and stuff, but I always tell people, don't ever do anything that you don't want to brag about. And then brag about it, you know, and share it with people because you're having fun, you know. We should talk about it instead. You go, oh, I do the minimum. I feel like accusing a winemaker of manipulation is like calling your wife a whore because she's sleeping with you. you There's you know? a good metaphor. Oh, she's yes, supposed to do her duty, and then she's supposed to feel bad about it, you know? It has to be bad stuff. Wow. Okay. So, what made you think of reverse osmosis? Oh, yeah. Well, that, I didn't even know what reverse osmosis was when I first hung out my consulting shingle in 1990. Okay. I was going to work for the Benzigers. Bruno Benziger's liver had gone bad on him, and uh, his doctor told him he had to quit drinking. Ooh. So, he got really interested in non-alcoholic wine and went out and bought a reverse osmosis unit. And I got put in charge of trying to develop non-alcoholic wine. 
that's where I really started to learn that wine is not just a collection of flavors because with non-alcoholic wine, you can add anything you want. And it's like soda pop, you know, there's no laws about adding flavors, but it didn't work because the wine didn't have any structure. Uh, that's, that was because the beginning of, of no alcohol. No, it's just that if you don't build the structure, you're not going to have one. Like the difference between a scrambled egg and a souffle. One has structure and the other is just kind of a mess. So that was the beginning of that. But anyway, when I was horsing around with this reverse osmosis, what it basically is, it's just a really, really tight filter so that all the color and flavor and tannin in the wine stays on the upstream side. And you just get water and alcohol very, very small molecules. And the other one is acetic acid. So I said, well, I was giving a talk about the sort of technical approaches to winemaking and flavor harvesting and that kind of stuff. Because we're very wasteful in the wine industry. We, we, you know, we never try to get all the flavor out of the skins or we lose a lot of aromas out of the fermentation vessels. You know, we just maybe half of the flavor that we start with. We get to so I was giving a lecture about how we could go about making better wines by retaining those flavors. And then I said, well, what if we got a flavor in the wine that we don't want? Maybe we could figure out a way to get it out. So this was the example I came up with, that you could just take that RO permeate that looks like water and run it through a water softener, and it would just take the acetic acid out. And then you just put the water and the alcohol back, and then you can take vinegar out of wine. And, and I didn't think any more about it for a couple of months. And then one of the guys that had been at the lecture I said, well, you know, we got this Merlot that's got a lot of BA and it's volatile acidity. Yeah. That's the winemaker code for vinegar. So we tried it and it worked like a charm. The wine went dry and it was wonderful. And uh, yeah, the wine doesn't go through the filter. It just bleeds off some of this stuff. As we call What is permanent. that stuff? What is it? It's, water? It's just water and, and a little alcohol and acetic acid. And that's so it. You're trying to lower the alcohol. Well, maybe I am and maybe I'm not. When we're taking out VA, all we do is take the acid out of this and put the water and the alcohol back. Oh. But in California, we do have the problem that our air is too dry. And right. so water evaporates from the grapes. Doesn't do that in uh, like New York, Virginia. They make much more balanced wines than we do. France has too much water, so they have to add sugar to correct the alcohol. We need to take alcohol out. So the way we do it is to just take this stuff and run it through a still, take the alcohol out, put the water back. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Clark Smith. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love Clark's comparison of soulful wines to a rich bisque versus a thin consomme. He also compares a souffle in which egg whites are suspended throughout the souffle through the whisking process to tannins in wine that are suspended throughout the wine by adding oxygen. Then, just as egg yolks are folded back into the mixture to create an even richer meringue, so too in wine when the leaves, those are the expired yeast cells that have a lovely bready character, are brought back into the wine during aging. Number two, it's fascinating how he can measure the oxygen appetite of wine inside a bottle to predict how well and how long it'll age. Number three, our man of metaphors compares styles of wines to three types of movies. The first are made to please you with lots of sweetness and oak, like Disney comedies and, I'd like to add, Hallmark Channel rom-coms. The second are action-adventure movies that are made to impress you with lots of heft and concentration, like the explosions and the special effects in those movies. And the third type requires you to work harder to understand those wines, like foreign films, especially the ones with subtitles. His favorite category is, of course, this third one, and he especially likes Cabernet Franc for that reason. I love his term, throat energy for vibrant wines with racy acidity. Number five, Clark says that wine communicates soul to soul and represents that marvelous intersection between science and the humanities, a sweet spot that Steve Jobs liked to occupy with his iPhones. And six, 
Clark is provocative with statements such as winemaking is a fancy form of canning to preserve fruit, but the underlying idea is solid. Chefs take pride in manipulating their ingredients, whether it's to create a foam essence of asparagus or to caramelize some other food. So why do winemakers feel that they can't touch their fruit and must be as low intervention as possible? Of course, everything can be taken to the extreme, but I think another word for intervention is artistry. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one who's interested in the fascinating winemaking insights that Clark shared and how they affect the wines we drink. You'll find links to Clark's website, social media handles, the video version of this conversation, and where you can find us on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 66. Finally, if you want to connect with me personally, join me in a free online video class at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. You won't want to miss next week when we'll be chatting with Elise Lambert, who not only has earned the coveted Master Sommelier designation, but she was also named Canada's Best Sommelier and came fifth in the world's Best Sommelier event. She has lots of tips and tricks for us when it comes to learning about and appreciating wine next Wednesday. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a wine that speaks to your soul. don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.